History is littered with people taking advantage of a power vacuum. Generals or other big personalities generally clamber to fill the void. Usually the players in this game of power are relatively young. However, sometimes there is an old grizzly war veteran who from seemingly nowhere swipes all of these younger players off the field and fills the power vacuum himself. This is the story of one of those grizzly aging veterans who, although being in his 60s, quickly and decisively asserted himself as one of the most powerful men in the ancient world. This is the story of Antigonus I, more commonly known as Antigonus the One-Eyed. When Philip II came to power in Macedon, he inherited a country which had been held back by multiple factors one of which was the constant power struggles, but another was the fact that the country as a whole had failed to keep up with their neighbouring Greek cousins. Philip, having been raised in Thebes, quickly began to revolutionise Macedon, introducing classical Greek way of thinking to the country. One of the areas Macedon was severely lagging behind was in its military. Macedon was famed for its cavalry, however, its infantry were way below par. This somewhat contradicted the Macedonian reputation of being hard brutes from the mountains. Philip quickly revolutionised the Macedonian army, implementing many military innovations which were taking place in classical Greece at the time. The Macedonian army quickly became one of the most powerful forces in ancient Europe, with Philip leading it himself in various campaigns that increased Macedon's holdings in the local area. In this new army was a relatively low-ranking captain who was scaling a ladder during one of Philip's sieges in 340 BC. From nowhere, this young captain was struck in the eye by a ballista. This man was our subject for today, Antigonus. Besides from this incident with the catapult, very little is actually known of Antigonus. In fact, by very little we mean hardly anything at all. He seems however to have been a professional soldier, as following Philip's death, and Alexander the Great's ascension to the throne, he had risen to be commander of a single infantry division. Being a troop commander, he accompanies the young king during his invasion of the Persian Empire. It is during Alexander's invasion of the Persian Empire that we start to see the kind of man Antigonus was. Alexander placed Antigonus in charge of defending his supply and baggage wagons something that was becoming increasingly more difficult as Alexander's holdings in the east expanded. Indeed, after the famous Battle of Issus, a battle in which Alexander smashed the Persian forces sent to defeat him, a portion of the Persian army regrouped in the region known as Cappadocia. This region was effectively sandwiched right in the middle of Alexander's holdings in Anatolia. This regrouped Persian force attempted to cut Alexander's supply lines, However, Antigonus was having none of this. He successfully repelled these attacks and as a result was given the governorship of a nearby province called Phrygia. However, there was a problem. You see, Alexander, although he claimed to now control Anatolia, in reality, he only really ruled the south and west coast. The actual interior of Asia Minor and the entirety of the northern coast was actually still very much free from Macedonian rule. So Antigonus had been effectively given a province that was only half conquered. Following his successful defence of the supply lines, Antigonus had the brutal task of consolidating Phrygia into the growing Macedonian Empire. By the time of Alexander's death in 323 BC, Antigonus held not only Phrygia but four other provinces in Anatolia. Antigonus ruled over these provinces as a governor, which was confirmed by the new regent Perdiccas. However, tension between the veteran infantry commander and the somewhat inept regent began to grow. Perdiccas ordered Antigonus to help Alexander's former secretary, Eumenes, to consolidate his rule over Cappadocia. Antigonus, however, did not have the troops necessary to carry out this action, especially as the other commander who had been sent to help in the consolidation of Cappadocia had just up and left. As a result, Antigonus refused to risk his life and the life of his men on securing a secretary, a small province. Enraged that Antigonus had refused his order, Perdiccas carried out the consolidation with the royal army himself, and then turned towards Phrygia, hoping to humble the veteran infantry commander. 
Antigonus, realising that this humbling was probably more likely going to be a swift execution, fled with his son Demetrius to Macedon, into the welcoming arms of Perdiccas' rival for the regency of the empire, the Macedonian regent Antipater. Together with extra help from the famed Macedonian general Craterus, the foursome began a campaign of undermining Perdiccas' authority over the empire. Things came to a head when Ptolemy, the governor of Egypt, stole Alexander's coffin and so incurred the wrath of Perdiccas, who summoned the royal army to face Ptolemy in the field. Antigonus and Antipater were quick to side with Ptolemy. However, the duo's plans to undermine Perdiccas had an unexpected casualty, when Craterus was not only defeated, but actually killed by the very man Antigonus had refused to help. Eumenes, Alexander's former secretary, was an apparent military genius, and has sided with Perdiccas in the new Macedonian civil war. However, with Perdiccas' assassination by his own men, Eumenes retreated east, with Antipater assuming the regency of the entire empire, and Antigonus becoming general over all of Asia Minor. However, Antipater would not be regent for long. Rather than pass the regency to his clear successor, his son Cassander, Antipater passed it on to another veteran general. This was widely seen as a bad move by a majority of the powerful governors of the empire, most noticeable of which was Antigonus. Antigonus's old rival, Eumenes, yet again sided with the region, and so began a game of cat and mouse between the two generals. Eumenes, however, had the military genius as well as support of the elite veteran Silver Shields, who when all else failed could be relied on to win the battle regardless. Eventually, it would be these very veterans who would give Antigonus the victory he needed. After a particularly sluggish battle, even by ancient standards, Antigonus found himself in command of the Silver Shield's baggage wagons, as well as their families. Effectively holding these items to ransom, Antigonus convinced the Silver Shield to switch sides and hand over his rival to him. With this victory, the eastern portion of the Macedonian Empire effectively came under the control of Antigonus, who marched into Babylon in triumph, scaring the governor of Babylon, Seleucus, out of the city and straight into the armies of Ptolemy, who along with Cassander and the governor of Thrace, Lysimachus, began to worry that Antigonus was becoming too powerful for his own good. The four allied with each other and began a brutal war against the aging infantry commander. Antigonus sent his son to deal with Ptolemy, whilst he and Seleucus began slogging it out in a long war over the territories of Babylon. Now, because historians are extremely bad at naming things, this war became known as the Babylonian War, because it took place in Babylon and it was a war. So, you see, Babylonian War. Clever. In the west, Ptolemy won a major victory over Antigonus' son, whilst at the same time, Seleucus finally recaptured Babylon. Not wanting to drag the war out any longer, Seleucus and Antigonus signed a peace treaty, effectively splitting the empire between them, Antigonus in the west and Seleucus in the east. Both generals then consolidated their territories. Within no time, however, war resumed when Cassander and Ptolemy complained that Antigonid garrisons had been installed in three Greek cities. This was the fourth and final war between the successors and would also be the climactic finale. Seleucus eventually threw his military weight behind his former allies, bringing with him the armies of the east to combine with those of Lysimachus and Cassander. Antigonus, marching out with his son to face this combined threat, was confident of victory. However, in the resulting Battle of Ipsus, Antigonus's cavalry was scared off the field by Seleucus's new war elephants, trapping Antigonus in the thick of the fighting. Antigonus died as he had lived, a soldier fighting on the battlefield. However, Antigonus' story does not end with his death. Within a matter of years, his son Demetrius had wrestled Greece from Cassander and had established a firm foothold in the region. He named the dynasty he founded the Antigonids in memory of his father. Within a matter of years, Antigonus had gone from unknown infantry commander to being one of the most powerful men in the ancient world. Only the combined might of the younger generation of generals stopped him from becoming the ruler over the entire Macedonian Empire. However, his legacy continued, with one of the greatest dynasties of the ancient world being named after him. Thanks for watching and listening to our video. 
If you like the channel, consider subscribing to Ancient History Guy. Or, if you really like the channel, head on over to our Patreon feed. There, for as little as $1 a month, you can gain access to exclusive documentaries, behind the scene footage, and videos before they're live on YouTube. All sources are listed and linked in the description below. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. I've been the Ancient History Guy, and as always, I'll be seeing you later.